Hello everyone and welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be talking about impedance tables and what they mean. Sometimes when you send a board in for production and it requires controlled impedance, if you didn't do the stack up design yourself, you're gonna get back an impedance table from your manufacturer. Sometimes you can get these impedance tables on the front end when you're using a standard stack up. I'm gonna go over what these impedance tables mean, how they're built, and how you can build one of your own if you're gonna do a custom stack up. Let's go ahead and get started. First things first, what is an impedance table? Well, sometimes when you go to produce a printed circuit board and you have an impedance control requirement, your manufacturer will send you an impedance table. Basically, this impedance table is telling you what the width of your traces needs to be in order to hit a specific impedance using their standard stack up. They may give you some additional information such as the dielectric constants, the thickness of the board, the thickness of the layers, so on and so forth, in order for you to do some additional modeling and simulation. But generally, what they're trying to tell you is what the trace width needs to be to hit your impedance targets. They'll do this for single-ended and differential traces. So in this video, what I want to do is show you how they construct these impedance tables, how to use them and how to interpret them, and of course, how to spot when an impedance table is bogus. Let's jump onto the board and take a look. What I'm gonna do is draw out an impedance table just for an example, eight layer PCB. So your impedance table is gonna have some rows and columns to it, obviously. First, you will have an impedance value, and then you'll have a layer assignment, and then you'll have a line width value. And on these layers, you may have some additional information such as DK. Now, you may also be given the thickness value as well. So typically what you'll do is you'll have an assignment for an impedance on let's say layer one, and since this is an eight layer board and we would assume symmetricity across the stack up, we would then also have this assigned to layer eight. Let's suppose we're targeting a 50 ohm single ended impedance on layer one and eight. When your manufacturer sends you the impedance table, they'll give you a line width in this column. And that line width could be, for example, 10 mil. Next entry in the table could also be 50 ohm single-ended, but maybe this time it's on layers three and six. So now we're assuming we have a ground plane below uh, layers one and layer eight. That gives us our microstrip configuration. Then the next available routing layers would be three and six. Those are in strip line. And then these could have a different line width, let's say six mil. And again, they may give you the DK values above and below as well as the layer thicknesses, so you could copy that into your CAD tool. Then they could also give you, for example, differential pairs. So let's just suppose for a moment that we have 90 ohm diff for differential. This could also be on layer three and six. And then in this case, they may specify that as, let's say, six mil, six mil spacing, and so on and so forth. They'll continue filling in values in this table until they filled up all the available signal layers for the impedances that you require. Sometimes you don't just have 50 ohms single-ended, but for example, maybe you have 40 ohms single-ended. So let's say for example, you have DDR and it has a different drive strength that doesn't require a 50 ohm single-ended. In this case, you might have this on layer one and eight. You might have another entry on three and six. And then this one might have a 12 mil wide requirement and so on and so forth. So they're gonna go through all of these different values and try and fill up all your signal layers with all these different impedances. And that's essentially what an impedance table is in its simplest sense. This then lets you create the design rules inside of your CAD tool, so that way you can ensure that whatever nets are requiring this impedance, you can route them with 10 mils on the outer layers and then six mils on the inner layers. And so in Altium Designer and in other CAD tools, you can create layer specific rules for routing so that these lengths are enforced. Now I wanna look at what happens when we have two different impedance profiles specified on the same layer in our stack up table. So let's just suppose that on layers one and eight, we have this 50 ohm single ended impedance profile that we had earlier with a 10 mil line width. What happens if we also have a 40 ohm single-ended impedance on layers one and eight with, let's say, a 13 mil line width. 
And let's just suppose we have a DK value of four for layers one and eight. So again, this is a symmetric stack up. It's DK four on both outer layers. What happens if we were to say swap a DK four laminate with instead a DK 3.5 laminate? Can we then continue to use both of these impedance profiles? Well, the answer is probably not. One of the things is going to have to change is the layer thickness on this outer layer. So before, in order to get to that 10 mil line width, we had approximately a five mil outer layer thickness. If we drop this down to a DK of 3.5, we would then have approximately four mil on that outer layer thickness. Now that four mil outer layer thickness might require a different line width in order to hit this 40 ohm single ended impedance. So this 13 mil value might not be useful anymore and it may need to change. Now this is important because you can't just swap out materials like this, readjust the thickness to hit a 50 ohm single imp ended impedance on one of your impedances and then expect all of the other impedances to still be accurate. So those impedance values that they give you when they put two impedance profiles on the same layer are specific to that DK and that layer thickness. If you start changing these values, one of these two impedance profiles might have to change in order to get back to these same impedances. Now that's sometimes why you have a guideline to not have multiple impedance profiles on the same layer. If instead you wanted to have these two different single-ended impedance profiles, and you're going to use impedance split tables to build your stack up, sometimes this would then have to live on a different layer. So you might then have to have your 40 ohm at single ended impedance on, let's say, layers three and six. Then your line width would have to be a different value and you'd probably have a different DK value as well. But that actually allows you to then change something on the outer layer and only this impedance profile is going to change. This other one will be unaffected. So for this reason, typically you will only see one single ended impedance profile located on a single layer and you'll have different layers allocated to different impedances or different signals. So in this example, we might have, let's say, uh, DDR on this layer, and then this might be for, let's say, an RF line up on the top layer. And so this shows you how different functionalities and different interfaces are allocated to different layers in order to hit these impedance targets. This is actually something that's a holdover from the old days of PCB design before everybody had these really nice impedance calculators built into their design tools and before you could find all these free impedance calculators online. Before all of that was accessible, you actually had to rely on all of this data in order to build a stack up that could support high speed signaling. Now I want to look at an instance where the data in the impedance table could be totally bogus. So let's just say, for example, we have an impedance table that specifies 50 ohm single ended impedance on layers one and eight with this 10 mil line width. And then we have, let's say, DK4 on the outer layer. Sometimes you will see a 100 ohm differential impedance also on the same layer set and then a 10 mil line width, and then probably a 10 mil spacing, or maybe even smaller, maybe only a five mil spacing if they think that they need to have tightly coupled differential pairs. What's wrong with this picture? Well, for those of you who are familiar with the difference between odd mode impedance and characteristic impedance, you will know that you cannot take a 50 ohm single-ended line and put it into a differential pair and then expect the impedance of that differential pair to just be double whatever the single ended line is. In fact, what will happen in this case is the real impedance of this differential pair will not be 100 ohms. It's actually gonna be a little bit less than 100 ohms. How much less? Well, it could be low enough below 100 ohms that it actually violates your impedance tolerances that you set in your manufacturing requirements. So if you see this type of specification on line width for a differential pair and for single-ended impedance on the same layer set, this is probably totally bogus and should not be followed. The only instances where it is not bogus is when that line spacing between the traces in the differential pair is very large. In that instance, the single-ended impedance of a trace in the differential pair will be very close to 
the single-ended impedance of a trace on its own. So we've talked about this in a video on odd mode impedance. Check out that video link in the description to learn more about this difference. Now, an impedance profile that would be valid in this case is to say 50 ohm single-ended impedance with let's say, again, 10 mil width and 90 ohm differential. In this case, let's say with 10 mil width. Now, in this case, they would just need to figure out what the spacing value is in order to get this differential impedance to be 90 ohms and not 100 ohms. And that spacing could be, let's say, 8 mils. I don't have the value memorized. I'm just kind of throwing a value up here. But you get the idea. What they'll give you is the line width and the spacing when it comes to this differential impedance. So this is not a bogus spec. This is actually an acceptable spec. But when they just take the same line widths and double it, it could be a bogus spec. So watch for that when you get an impedance table from a manufacturer. Now, one question you might be asking about all this data is this, where do they get all this data? Well, there are a number of ways that they can get this data. The first way they can get this data is of course through measurement. When you actually request controlled impedance testing on a board that you're having built with a fabricator, they will do some testing on a test coupon or on the side of the panel that they're building with your boards. The other way that they can get it is with a simulation tool. So they may have just a simple impedance calculator. They may have something like Polar or Symbior. And using any of those tools, they can actually figure out some of this data. And typically, if they're smart, they will also go back and test it just to verify that the numbers that they're giving you are correct. So let's just jump into Altium Designer real quick. I'm gonna show you how you can figure out all of these values for your own impedance table. So now let's take a look at how a typical PCB impedance table can be created from simulation. So one way to do this, as I said earlier, is just using an impedance calculator. And if you know the impedance calculator is accurate and you've qualified it against some measurements, then it's perfectly acceptable to create an impedance table from it. So here I just have an example in Altium Designer. If I just click add impedance profile for a single ended impedance, what I get here is a set of trace widths targeting a 50 ohm impedance. So here what we care about are of course the impedance on layers one, and then we're gonna also target a strip line on layer three. Now on layer one, you can already see what my impedance is with DK4 laminate. It is 8.8 .8 mils. So next, let's suppose that we wanna match that same 8.8 .8 mil trace width on layer three. So that way we can use the same trace width all the way through the stack up. Well, then what we could do is we could basically just adjust whatever the layer thickness is above and below this strip line in order to hit that 50 ohm impedance. So right now, if I just expand this column, you can see here that when I just copied and pasted the width from layer one into layer three, I get a decent sized deviation in impedance. So this is more than 10%, and that's gonna be above typically what most people will use for an acceptable tolerance. So here, if I just adjust this distance to ground, let's say I make it eight mils, you can see I can get back pretty close to 50 ohms, and we could use that as our layer thickness in this stack up. Then what the fabricator will do is they will make up the balance of the total board thickness that they need by just adjusting this other layer. So here I'm gonna adjust the central layer and bring it back up to, let's say, 27 mils. And that's gonna get my total thickness, as you can see over here, back up to 62 mils. So what the fabricator has to do is basically mix and match the various materials in order to hit those impedance targets and in order to hit those width targets. Now, they could take a little bit of a different approach. For example, they could set a 10 mil width on the outer layer and then maybe a six mil width on the inner layer. So this was an example I showed on the board. Well, in this case, they're also going to have to mix and match their various PCB materials in order to hit those values. So they may have a list of layer thicknesses and DKs that they can try and move in and out of this stack up in order to ensure that these width values hit this target impedance, for example, of 50 ohms. So in this case, with our outer layer, maybe that requires, for example, a DK4 laminate exactly, and then maybe a six mil outer layer. So eventually, if I just kind of adjust these uh, thicknesses, looks like 5.5 gets us really close. So if our fabricator has a DK4 laminate with 5.5 mil thickness, 
that they can use on the outer layer, then they will add that to the stack up. And they'll go through this process of adjusting all of these other layer thicknesses in order to hit these impedance values on the interior layers of the stack up. That's how they'll create this through simulation. Some fabrication houses will do a bit more work on this setup for impedances, and they'll actually take this and calculate losses. How do they calculate the losses? Well, if they're going to do it in simulation, they'll need to export to another tool like a Symbior or like a Polar, or they will then go through and measure what the losses are, and then they'll give that value to you so you can use those to set up your interconnects in your CAD tool. Once they've zeroed in on these values that they wanna use for the materials and they know what the width values are, they can then go over to, for example, Microsoft Excel. They can start filling in a table just like this. They'll put in the layer information, they'll put in the impedance information, they'll put in the line width information, and they'll just continue filling this out kind of like I'm doing here. Once they have this filled out, they can then send that to you so you can use it to build your own PCB stack up. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. I hope this gives you the information that you need in order to understand everything that you're seeing in a PCB impedance table. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And of course, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.